Hi everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Seth McCombs. I am a software engineer focusing on cloud orchestration and Kubernetes things at Workday. Uh, and in the upstream Kubernetes project, I've also spent some time on the release teams, as well as working as parts of SIG docs and, and SIG release in the past. Today, I'd like to cover a topic uh, some people may have avoided or have some, some preconceptions about. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about managed Kubernetes services. Uh, and, and by managed, I mean using a cloud provider's uh, kind of Kubernetes as a service offering. Um, now, I won't be diving into specifics around any one cloud provider's offering. We're not going to get that technical. Uh, I'm just covering the overall idea of using a Kubernetes uh, managed Kubernetes service, why you may want to consider doing so. Um, and in, in the case of some cloud providers, they may only have you know, one sort of Kubernetes offering. Some may have different levels of kind of abstraction around their, their Kubernetes offering. Uh, so, you know, depending on where you may find your infrastructure running, uh, you may have some choices there. So the original title for this talk was uh, a little more aggressive than, than the one I ended up going with. It was something along the lines of using a managed Kubernetes service doesn't make you a bad engineer. And while I still believe that statement wholeheartedly, uh, I thought it was best to lighten up a little bit. Uh, before my current role in, in past various info-related roles, I found that even though I wanted Kubernetes to be the only thing I was working on, you know, to be the focus of my day-to-day, -day, uh, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't the case. Uh, Kubernetes was the platform I was deploying on, and what really mattered were the services I provided to my end users, whether they were the developers, the actual, you know, consumers of the product or service the company made, the executives that used some sort of service. Um, you know, the Kubernetes clusters I ran were just a means to an end. Uh, and it was in one of these roles that I came to terms with using a managed Kubernetes service. Um, and it was a service provided by a cloud provider. And I found that by offloading uh, much of the day-to-day -day overhead operational stuff I needed to do to keep clusters running, uh, it freed me up to work on some other cool stuff, toil less, and uh, it, was, it was definitely something that worked for me. So that's it, right? I found using a managed Kubernetes service worked for me. The story has a happy ending, and we're all done. Well, I found sometimes folks at KubeCons, meetups, um, other, other similar events, uh, when I said something along the lines of, you know, I'm using a managed Kubernetes service from my cloud provider. Um, I often received one response uh, uh, more than others, and that response was why. Uh, why would I use that instead of running my own? And I always thought, why not? Um, I've offloaded a bunch of my operational overhead uh, and toil and tedium to a cloud provider's team. Uh, their sole purpose is to run this cluster and keep it running, and I get to focus on building cool stuff on top of it. Why, why wouldn't I want that? So I learned a lot talking to these folks um, and you know, some, some whys and why nots for their decisions to not use these services, a lot of valid points. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna try to dispel some myths around using these services with some experience I've had in the past. Um, maybe leave you with some answers to questions you've had, and, and also because nothing's perfect, uh, I'm definitely going to touch on, on some negatives you may encounter, uh, with the goal being that by the end of this, uh, you have enough context to weigh some options about you know using one of these services, maybe moving off of your current platform that you run yourself, uh, or maybe you're an engineering leader or a team lead looking to greenfield something on Kubernetes and just getting started. Um, and, and also, I know that many people want to run their own cluster. Uh, they, they have valid reasons. They've built their own tools, adapted and adopted some upstream or open source things, and that's totally fine too. Uh, I'm, not tell, I'm not here to tell you you need to use you know, one of these, these managed services, these Kubernetes as a service kind of platforms. Um, I'm only here to say that it is totally okay if you do. Um, and, and you, you know, don't let people get you down and, and make you feel like you're any less deserving of space because you, uh, you didn't build it all yourself. So these days, Kubernetes is the go-to buzzword. Uh, we're sitting at KubeCon right now. This Kubernetes thing is big. If you're not using it, you probably want to use it. If you don't use it, you probably have a valid reason, maybe after looking into it, that you don't want to use it. Um, these days, uh, Kubernetes clusters aren't something you take to the bank. If, if you've moved your service from big monoliths to containers on top of Kubernetes, that's you know something huge to brag about. I've done it. It's a, there's a lot of work involved. Um, but what I mean is it's not a bullet point on your sales pitch. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about if you're providing like a SaaS offering here. Uh, when someone asks, why should I use your product or service? Uh, your two points for your sales pitch shouldn't be, we're lower cost and we run on Kubernetes. Uh, what really matters is what your clusters allow you to do. Less downtime, faster iterations on the you know, software you're developing and deploying. If you can deploy your microservice in you know, a fraction of the time versus your monolith, you can get to market faster, you know, things like that. 
Um, I believe it was a few KubeCons back that, that Liz Rice said something along the lines of uh, Kubernetes is boring. It's, it's what you do with it that's interesting. And so that's how I've started to approach my use of Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not looking in my day-to-day -to, -day to run the most customized, state-of-the-art, uh, you know, amazing clusters. Um, I want all the benefits that Kubernetes can bring me, um, but I don't need the bragging rights of, of building in, it all myself. So what, what is a managed service? Um, what do I mean when I say that? We have a few options under that umbrella, and, and all of them revolve around some fact that, that someone does it for you. Uh, to some, this is a positive. To others, this is a negative. Before we land on either side, uh, we can break it down. Uh, some providers offer you a managed control plane. They handle the API servers, the controller scheduler, all the associated bits there. They give you an API endpoint to run your kubectl commands against, um, leaving it up to you to deploy your virtual machines as you see fit. Uh, some sort of template they provide or some automation you've built. Um, others have automated this as well. It's one or two clicks to deploy your node pools, specify size, count, networking, all that stuff. Uh, some are completely automated, where you are responsible for building your containers, you upload them to their registry, and they do all the deployment and scaling for you. Um, you know, so that kind of moves beyond the Kubernetes as a service and, and is at one extreme uh, of the end of the spectrum there. Um, and then, you know, I, I'll also call out uh, some of the companies and consultants, service providers that can help you configure clusters uh, on your existing cloud platform, uh, you know, or one of these managed services. Um, you know, they help you avoid a lot of pitfalls for setup. Uh, and it's definitely not what I was thinking about, what I had in mind when I started this talk about using a, a purely managed service, you know, but I, I, I recognize that a lot of companies are still on-prem or in colos, and so I think it's valuable to, to keep those uh, in mind. So what do you get when you pick a managed service? Uh, one of the biggest things in my experience that I always think of um, was the peace of mind around somebody else running my etcd cluster. You could say that about the whole control plane, you know, I will, that is, it is nice to not have to worry about that, but I first thought purely about etcd. Uh, I, I went through running clusters, migrating from, from etcd uh, version 2 to version 3. Uh, that was some fun I never, uh, I hope to never have to do again. Uh, I've seen what happens when an etcd cluster gets broken and, and split brains there. Um, you know, you start getting different responses back every other time you run a kubectl command. Uh, it's just, it's just not fun. Um, I've been using Kubernetes for a few years now. Uh, I'm still not an expert in running a control plane or, or an entire cluster. Um, so when I can offload things to other specialists, it's something I'm going to do. Um, and so that's, that's one of the biggest points I, I start out when I start talking about, you know, using a managed service. Um, if my cloud provider has a team of experts that can keep this running and, and that's just a sub service I subscribe to, and it takes some, some overhead off my plate, that's huge. Uh, so next up, you have more time to do the other, the cool stuff, you know, the building, the deploying of things actually on Kubernetes. Uh, you know, I'm not going to market with, hey, here's my service and it runs on Kubernetes, un unless you sell an application that runs on Kubernetes. Um, normally your end users don't care about that. They want your service to be up, working, responsive, scalable, low cost, insert buzzword here. They want all those things. They want new features faster. Um, and, and you know, what really matters is what you build on top of your cluster. Uh, if we truly talk about Kubernetes as a, as a platform that, you know, democratizes these containers we can deploy anywhere, um, why wouldn't I let someone else whose sole purpose is to run Kubernetes clusters do it for me? Um, you know, I, I view it in the similar vein to picking frameworks for coding and, and things like that, you know, uh, let somebody else simplify it for me and I can do the, you know, the easy parts. So next up, uh, you know, Kubernetes is complex. If you ask an engineer uh, that's been using Kubernetes for a few years, uh, what's one thing you wish you could change? A lot of times it's, it's some form of make it less complex. Uh, oftentimes, you know, when getting started, but you know, just overall. Uh, I'm all about a, a couple click process to deploy a new cluster. Um, scaling, some people don't have to worry about their API servers handling a surge of requests or ensuring they have sufficient worker nodes. Um, if you do have those worries, you know, using these managed services can take that off at their, their, uh, your plate, you know, and just uh, make it easier for you. Um, I, again, I want to keep working on what I'm building. Um, there's a great run of, of security talks at KubeCon and, you know, current and in the past. And one call out, call out is often that Kubernetes is, is rather insecure by default, you know. So if I have a trusted advisor that can help me set things up, configure things in a way that secures my workloads, gives me a great starting point. Uh, you know, I'll take it. And and why I'm calling these things out 
is that these are tasks that can easily take days of work from one or more engineers, you know, and those story points start to add up and all of a sudden your sprints turn into crawls. Uh, you know, basically you don't have to be an expert in all these things. No one can know everything and that's not a bad thing. By and large, these services are less complex than doing it myself. Have you ever scrolled through the readme and, and the docs for one of the services you would use to deploy a cluster? Uh, you know, those things get verbose fast. And, um, you know, this is no shade to teams that write these docs and these readmes. You know, they're doing heroes work, but there's only so much you can do to make a, you know, the configuration of a complex service read is less complex. And, and the source code for Kubernetes, there's a lot there, you know. So, again, I want to build on top of it and let somebody else specialize in running the platform. So next up, we've talked about what it is. We've talked about some some pros, why I like it, you know, why you may like it uh, using these services. And s just want to call out a couple common complaints that people would have when I would tell people I used these these types of services. Uh, and and I know we're all we're all thinking of this one because um, we're all conscious of our cloud spends. So doesn't it cost more? You know, we're all conscious of of our cloud spend, uh, and and that costs more than a than a self managed cluster. Uh, and I I think of it this way, you know. Cloud bills don't happen in a vacuum. If I just look at the bill for my cloud provider or my service provider, I'm going to see, you know, whatever the managed API endpoints for my clusters cost per hour. Um, and, and that may drive my bill up. But on the other side of things, you know, there's still someone who's hands on keyboards automating and setting up, you know, my self managed clusters and, and things like that. There's still people at those keyboards hacking away on stuff. So you may have a team of one person, you may have a team of 20. But either way, I'm, I'm you know, almost 100% certain that that person's not working for free and you pay them to do what they do. So you have to think, you know, what are you saving in terms of, of spend? Are you spending less on your bill but paying your engineer for more time? You need to figure that out. In, in my past experience, I found that by, you know, unblocking myself to build cool stuff, uh, when I was, you know, a, a team of one at, at a mobile app startup, um, by making somebody else have to worry about the I want to run Kubernetes kind of thing and get to, me just get to deploy more things on top of it, uh, not only did I sleep better at night, but I was able to get more stuff done. Uh, and to me, that was worth the uh, the increase in our cloud bill and and thus an argument I was able to take to the actual, you know, uh, people that paid that bill and say, hey, here's why we need this. So with most things around cost and money, it's multifaceted. You know, what's the cost of running your own versus a uh, managed service? What is the time your engineers spend on these? Upgrading, recovering, uh, you know, what is their time worth and, and how do you break that down? Uh, could they be automating something else? You know, deploying a new service, scaling to a new region, all these things add up and I think it's worth looking into, you know, so... Um, one call out, don't take this as permission, you know, if you are some sort of executive uh, or engineering leader, don't take this as permission to fire your engineering team if you move to a managed Kubernetes service. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that unless you need the customizations of managing your own clusters, uh, choosing a managed service allows your engineers to focus on higher level, higher priority projects. Uh, you should not be removing those engineers entirely. They should be building the stuff that matters, not just the platform. So uh, another another thing around um, around around cost that that is a little abstract is is what about the the vendor lock in that that people think of you know that was the other thing is I don't want to be stuck on this specific provider's platform um, and that may be your case and I empathize with that uh, so one of the things that I think about with these managed services. Um, you know, if you're on a cloud, you've already picked your cloud. You're using their service for VMs or, or managed database service. You're letting them handle networking, things like that. Uh, you're all you're you're pretty invested. Uh, so where do you draw the line? This this may be it. This may be you know where you say no. I I will use their their virtual machines, but you know I will configure Kubernetes on top of that. I want to have that level of control. Uh, maybe this is maybe the line is somewhere past this, and you say no no. Let's use their service. You know, uh, and and have them run our um, our Kubernetes clusters. You know, this is the trust you've made with your provider to handle the physical side of things, and and where you draw the line with what you deploy on top is is something you need to figure out. Um, you know, so you may find that uh, if you want to move from one cloud provider to another, there may be some concessions you need to make. But you know, I I've never encountered companies that really change cloud providers overnight. It's it's definitely not a decision made lightly. Uh, and, and all these managed services are all Kubernetes objects at the end of the day. It's deployments and pods and stateful sets and volumes all the way down. So, you know, you can take your Kubernetes stuff from managed service A and deploy it on managed service B. Uh, it's just the initial setup that might look a little differently. Um, 
Now, this is different than using what I called out earlier, you know, one of those fully managed services where you basically upload your containers and they handle all the other things. That pretty much abstracts away Kubernetes. Um, and and that, that may be your serious vendor lock-in, but it also might be beneficial depending on the size of your operations teams. Um, you know, so... Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. You know, you're writing your your code, you're building your container images, you write your Helm charts, you break out your ruler to indent your YAML. You know, but it's going to be a cluster at the end of the day. It's going to be a Kubernetes cluster at the end of the day. So, you know, vendor lock-in is real. Um, this may or may not increase your lock-in, but but even if it does, you're probably already locked in in a few other ways. Um, so, and even if you're not locked in at all, it's very rare you're going to change cloud providers overnight. So next up you've decided to look into your managed Kubernetes service. You know, what are you looking for? What do you want? So, you know, the first thing to call out is, does your cloud provider have, do you have options? Does your cloud provider have different methodologies of setting this up? Do you only have one option? And then it kind of comes down to maybe a binary decision to, you know, self-manage or not, you know, so what do you look for? One of the things I was looking for or was intrigued by was, you know, how many buttons did it, did I have to click to get set up? How long did it take me to deploy these things? You know, there's a decent chance that no matter how many buttons you have to click to get set up, it's probably easier than writing these uh, config files on a self-managed uh, cluster yourself. So this one might not be as important to you. Depends on how many clusters you deploy and how often. If you have five clusters and they're pretty much static, you know, the initial setup doesn't really matter to you once you're going. If you're constantly tearing down and redeploying or scaling or, you know, things like that, that time to having a full cluster up and running might, you know, be important to you. Um, as, as you know, is, is the buzzword so much as of late, rightfully so, uh, what does security look like? You know, we've had some, some CVEs and Kubernetes in the past. How long do these providers take to get those patched and deployed? Uh, and then what does it take for you to uptake that in your cluster? Does it interrupt you? Does it cause downtime? Uh, is there historical records of security issues in the past, maybe based on their platform-specific setup? You know, that's something to think about. And then lastly, you know, what do they expose in terms of metrics, you know, monitoring and, and keeping an eye on these these things that you're using to run your infrastructure? You know, most cloud providers have some sort of inbuilt visualization tool. They let you see some logs and metrics. Uh, you know, access logs are also important for security. Uh, so while you may abstract away some of the management of the the administrative uh, administrivia of your cluster, you know you still want to understand what's going on. You know uh, how how obscure is is too obscure and abstract for these things. You know. So like any solution, you know there's a a lot of these these fun um, fun SRE related terms, uptimes, SLOs, SLIs, things like that. Uh, what are, what do they guarantee in terms of availability? How many nines do you get at the end of the day, if that's something you care about? Uh, what happens if the service goes down? You know, are there uh, historical records of, of long outages that, that maybe are too much risk for you to take on? You know, uh, how does this compare to your existing infrastructure having issues? You know, is it more or less risky? Um, you know, this, this is one of those things to think about when thinking about that lock-in. You know, if your if your provider's you know object storage breaks, is it any more or less damaging than if their Kubernetes clusters go walkabout? You know, and you start having problems. You know, so there's definite trade-offs there, uh, and it also depends on just your 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 team power, how many hands you have on keyboards to to keep these things running. So we want to make sure providers keep up their end of the deal. Uh, so many people talk about their cloud providers when they have an issue. Uh, you can get a refund. You can get cloud credits. And credits are great. That's awesome. Less, less money to spend on the bill. But I bet that oftentimes the credits you get aren't uh, equal in value to lost revenue or lost productivity. So, you know, weigh the options. Um, and lastly, how do they handle uh, just overall upgrading? How, how one touch or how, how white glove, for lack of a better term, is it? How, you know, how... Uh, smooth do these things go does it does it offer down does it make you your clusters take some downtime is it a single click you know things like that um how do they patch the operating systems and run times is that exposed to you do you even care um you know these are some uh kind of some of the questions to add to your kubernetes shopping list um so you know there's not one way to do this. Um, there's there's a couple paths I've seen taken in the past on how to deploy these services or how to at least begin your investigation. I've used a, I've used both of them. Um, you know, the first being you you're not using Kubernetes. You want to use it. You've heard about this thing. You want to check it out. The other one being you're already building and deploying your own clusters using some sort of framework, either upstreamed or, or in house. You know, for the first one, you want to see what it's all about. Uh, why waste your time diving into the weeds, configuring all these uh, 
these bits and, and twiddling all these these knobs. Um, if you have a platform available from your cloud provider, we probably have a managed Kubernetes service. So, you know, try it out, see how it works. What are the options available? And, and think about later whether or not you need all the customization. Um, you might not know what you're missing and that might be a good thing. Um, so, you know, just really, you, this is good enough to make sure Kubernetes is right for you because there's a whole other talk I could give about whether or not you need a Kubernetes cluster, but that's not what I'm here for. Um, if you're not running on a public cloud, you're in a colo or you, you know, have your own data centers, you can still fire up a cluster on a public cloud service, check it out and see if, you know, at least this, this Kubernetes mindset works for you, you know? Um, and then also this is where those third party companies can come in and help you deploy your own, you know, clusters and kind of get you going there. But there's, there's probably more, uh, hoops to jump through with that. So, you know, the big thing that I liked, uh, as I called out, was the delay on a lot of the configuration choices I needed to make and just try it out with a managed service and say, hey, I like this, this paradigm, this declarative syntax, and then decide later uh, if you need more customization. There are thousands of blogs, uh, videos, conference talks all over the internet on how to get more out of your cluster. So if you decide later on down the road that customization is what you need, then you can move to a place where you run your own. Um, so you know, the other side of that, the flip side of the coin is maybe you're already doing it yourself. You hopped on the bandwagon early or late and you know, you've, you've got your clusters running and you're ready to go. Um, you find that your engineering team spend a lot of time keeping these things up to date, keeping them running and you want to find an easier way. Why not take a development environment and stand it up on a managed cluster? Uh, is it easier? Does it work better? Do the devs even notice a difference? Uh, depending on how you answer these questions, if it looks good, move forward. Um, and lastly, it doesn't have to be all or nothing as well. Uh, maybe you have some sort of tooling cluster where your CICD stack runs, you know, that's where your Jenkins lives or something like that. Um, you don't need a lot of customization there, but it does need to be rock solid. Um, you can use a managed service for that. That's a valid use case. You, maybe your production environments need to be hyper customizable. You need all those knobs and dials. You need to change your API server flags and all that fun stuff. Um, but for the dev environments or these admin environments, your logging aggregation or monitoring environments, you know, maybe those can be managed clusters because they, they either change too often or not often enough that it really matters. Um, you know, it can help to offload some of this setting up and configuring in these environments and you don't have to move your entire workload to a managed services, maybe move some of your stack. Um, you know, so it's, it's different on a case by case basis. Um, maybe you save some money, you probably save some time, you know, you unblock your ops and infra teams from, you know, working on all, everything that they don't want to toil on and they get to spend some time actually keeping the production environments producing. And, uh, you know, maybe their devs get the baseline environment with a few, you know, mouse clicks and they get to work. So as I said at the beginning, maybe it's an easy choice uh, and you have a cloud provider and they offer a Kubernetes service. Does it fit your needs? Uh, maybe they have multiple options at different levels of managed um, or abstractions, you know, at the least. Um, but no matter which way you go, building it brick by brick um, or, you know, allowing a provider to do it for you or taking it all uh, in-house and doing it yourself. My whole point here has been um, we're all here to build some cool stuff. It doesn't matter how you get there from scratch with the head start of a managed service. Um, and I don't just, you know, push on this from a Kubernetes specific point. Build your cool stuff. Use the tools you need, the tools you like, whatever works for you. The bragging rights that you self-manage your clusters make you no more skilled than the team that uses Cloud Provider X's managed Kubernetes services. Um, and I think this is a big takeaway, especially around these conference times. KubeCons can be overwhelming the first time, the third time, every single time. There's a fire hose of talks, uh, connections, knowledge to gain, but you don't ever have to feel bad about how you got from point A to point B and beyond. Uh, so if nothing else, I want you to take that away um, from my time with you today is build some cool stuff in a way that works for you. All right. And uh, that's, that's all I really needed to touch on about some managed clusters. Again, uh, my name is Seth and uh, now we'll open it up for some questions. Thank you.